Hi everyone, welcome to tonight's Educator Innovator webinar. Tonight we'll be talking to uh, some folks from Aurora Public Schools in Aurora, Colorado, where I also work. I'm one of those folks. And we're going to be talking about the Scalable Game Design Project, and uh, where we have kids engaged in designing video games in the classroom, and something we're trying to highlight during this Computer Science Education Week, and specifically with the Hour of Code. But before we get started, I'd like to give a special welcome to the educators joining us throughout the Educator Innovator Network. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Educator Innovator, it provides an online meetup for those who are reimagining learning. Educator Innovator is both a blog, is both a blog, it's both a blog and a growing network of educators, partners, and supporters. If we want to educate a generation of young people to be innovators, to create, build, design, and use their talents to improve their world, we need to value their creative capacity and the mentors, teachers who support them. Join the Educator Innovator blog to learn more. So, like I said before, this week is Computer Science Education Week, and Code.org is promoting a project called the Hour of Code. They hope that teachers will engage their students in an hour of coding or programming this week in an effort to have 10 million kids exposed to coding. Aurora Public Schools in Aurora, Colorado is involved in an exciting project called Scalable Game Design that is a partnership with CU Boulder connected to research being done by Dr. Alex Repening and his team. So we'll have a chance to hear a little bit about that project from Alex himself. And then we'll also talk with some teachers who have been uh, engaged in scalable game design at the middle school and the high school level. Um, the, the work that students do in scalable game design is interest-driven learning, developing games, using the program's agent sheets and agent cubes. And so we're happy to report here during Computer Science Education Week and the Hour of Code that our students haven't done just an hour of code, but they've done hours and hours of code at participating schools. And so we're anxious to have this conversation to talk about what we're learning from students when we engage them in scalable game design. So I think it's important that we quickly whip around here and uh, introduce ourselves. Once again, I'm Joe Dillon, and I'm the, I'm the uh, Instructional Coordinator for Educational Technology here in APS. And would everyone else like to introduce themselves? Hi, I'm uh, Alex Repening. I'm a professor in computer science at the University of Colorado, and I'm directing the Scale of Game Design project. Hi, my name is Kevin Rebau, and I am the director of educational technology for Aurora Public School District. Thanks for having me. Hello, my name is uh, Mark Scholdeis. I'm a computer teacher and technology coordinator at Marachek Middle School in the Aurora Public Schools. And I've been a participant in the Scamble Game Design Initiative for six years now. Ah, very good. I'll get to repeat that. So I was muted. Wasn't that nice? So uh, about a year ago, uh, Kevin and I had an opportunity to walk into Mark's classroom at his invitation because he, he wanted to share the work his students were doing designing video games. And, and with just that brief understanding of what we might see, um, we walked into Mark's celebration of Computer Science Education Week last year, and we saw all kinds of students um, sharing out with their peers and with their parents video games they designed and they were walking these kids through uh, the programs they built and then they'd also uh, they also were allowing their peers to play in a uh, in an arcade and so Kevin and I were immediately fascinated and of course we were uh, we were just so excited to know that Mark was engaged in this project for I think about five years so Oh, here comes Lois. So that really began, like, 
that's where we at, at the district level got really excited about scalable game design, and we started learning about the project. So before we kick it over to Alex, who will explain just a little bit about the research, I want Lois to be able to introduce herself. Hi, Lois. I'm glad you could make it. Um, thanks. I apologize. I thought it would be easier to connect from home <laughs> since I got kicked out of my lab after school. So. Well, you're on now. We're happy to have you. Will you tell us who you are and what you're doing here? Okay. I'm Lois Richards. I'm a technology instructor in middle school. I teach technology to 6th, 7th, and 8th grade middle schoolers. Anything else? Nope. That's it. So, Lois, this is just an informal conversation, and I want to... Alex is going to just briefly explain... Um, the, the basics of the research and the project, and then we'll just talk about what you guys have learned teaching okay. scalable game design and working with kids. So uh, it's informal, and so that's why it's great that you arrived just a few minutes late. Okay. So Alex, can you just give us a little bit of background about the project and then maybe what's going on with your team during the Hour of Code and sure. Computer Science Education Week? Sure. So this research at the University of Colorado goes back almost 20 years. And it started when we created new kinds of programming languages and programming tools because we realized that many of the students did not uh, really enjoy and appreciate the idea of programming. So, in fact, one quote of a girl at the time was, programming is hard and boring. And that points out that there's basically two challenges. So the hard part means there are really many cognitive challenges because at the time, programming environments simply were too hard to use. So in a classroom with many kids, you were just one semicolon away from total disaster. And that was bad. And so we started to explore new kinds of ideas and pioneered this idea of uh, dra drag and drop programming. And ever, ever since, that has helped a lot. This uh, Basically, you know, you have bits and pieces of, of programming blocks that you can drag on a screen around, and you avoid any kind of syntactic problem. But we have gone f further in, in the meantime, realizing that even though we solved a big part of the puzzle, it's syntax only. And, and that the equivalent would, would be to say, you know, if I give you a word processor and enable spell checking, and then I say, well, now it's really hard to mistype words. So therefore, it should be super easy for you to write a best-selling novel. You would just laugh at me and say, oh, no, no, that's not true because it's still hard. And the same is true for programming. So we looked at the even higher level kinds of uh, programming tools that help you with programming and debugging. So that's the hard part of the challenge. But then there's also the boring part. Why do the kids think that programming is boring? And in many cases, it's the types of things that we try to make them do. So, for instance, if you say, oh, why don't you compute something like prime numbers? Turns out many of the kids don't really want to compute prime numbers or sort numbers or do activities like that. And so a big part of that is ownership, where we essentially say, well, if you could make a video game where you can make your own characters, then bring these characters to life by programming them, maybe that would be much more engaging because you, you could create art, you could create three-dimensional and two-dimensional shapes that you actually would be interested in uh, exploring and, and building programs for. And so we have seen that especially with, with girls and underrepresented uh, communities that this really makes a huge difference. And then over time we also realized that when Initially, we just started with after-school programs, but, but more recently, we have uh, started to move these activities into the curriculum. And so, for instance, in Aurora, there, have, there are now many classrooms where they are using the curriculum we have developed called Scalable Game Design. And it's very important that it, it is part of the school in the sense that everybody basically can participate. So I believe, for instance, in Mark's school, there's uh, roughly over 300 students per year per school participating. And that's extremely exciting to us. The overall research actually is to say, can we start the kids mo motivating them through video game design? So not playing, but making their game. Motivating them to build computational artifacts then transition them later 
into actually making signed simulations. And from a research point of view, that means we need to very carefully explore ideas of uh, transfer and scaffolding so we, we even measure concepts. So, we, so when students basically make a video game, we, we can literally analyze what kinds of computational thinking patterns are in that game, and then we, we can look if the, if the same patterns r later manifest themselves by having them build a science simulation. So, so that's basically the idea. We have been doing this for a, a long time, and, and with many schools, we have been able to go to entire school districts, and they are very excited particularly to work with Aurora, because they have really, at a, at a very large level, started to bring these ideas into the classroom. And, and as was said, you know, not, not just an hour of code, but many, many hours of code. So very exciting to us. Yeah, and thanks for that intro. I think one of the things that might be particularly of interest to this audience is that, uh, especially teachers of writing, are familiar with the concept of a mentor text, that students learn how to write oftentimes by looking at professional texts. And, and although they can't necessarily produce professional texts, professional texts suggest possibilities for student writing. And so this concept of mentor texts is of interest to a lot of teachers of writing. And it's particularly notable because with scalable game design, when a student programs their first game, they're often looking at classic arcade games and deconstructing those. So they often start with a Frogger-like game. And so I think that that, is, that in particular is really interesting, the idea that we can study, prof students can study a professional model and then approximate that and even iterate off of that. So I think that's is really notable about the work. Um, and I guess I'd like to kick it over to Mark because Mark is, uh, I think he's going on his sixth year of working with scalable game design in the classroom. And, and uh, I know this week, during Computer Science Education Week, Mark is uh, having his students write a virus simulation. So again, a lot of the programming skills they've developed in, in developing games, right, Mark's now asking them to transfer to uh, virus simulations. So Mark, could you speak a little bit about, first of all, your background with scalable game design, and then the exciting stuff that's happening in your classroom this week? My apologies, they're using the PA in my building. I don't think you want to hear the PA. Um, I started uh, oh, I don't know, about five and a half years ago in the project, um, and it was started out as a, uh, an addition to our STEM uh, emphasis here at Marachek and several of the schools here in the rural public schools. And we started by learning Frogger and moving on to some other games, and then... Uh, we were exposed uh, through these summer institutes at CU Boulder, which we've attended every year. Well, I've attended every year since and then started helping other teachers and at those institutes as well. Um, learning those different items. So just to kind of shorten this up a little bit, um, I've, I've found this to be the most engaging uh, tool or project that I've ever seen any other teacher use or used myself in my 23 years of teaching. It's a phenomenal tool. Um, kids find it engaging, it's very challenging, and they're learning computational thinking patterns. And that's the emphasis of the whole deal is to teach computational thinking um, inside the project. And then inside of that, we're using um, some of the emphasis of writing skills and planning and so forth to pre-plan what the kids are doing. So for example here, let me share a screen with you. this up. It's an example of a the virus contagion simulation I'm building with students currently. This is my example. I'm just doing a basic one. But it's just the basics of them gathering some uh, data uh, and learning how to use simulation properties. Pardon. Yeah. Yeah. Un unfortunately, we're doing this at the same time we're having a choir concert at my school tonight, a band concert. So I'll uh, see if I can unhook that speaker here in a minute. Anyway, um, this is an example of having some healthy people and sick people, how they're getting sick, and the kids are experiencing, even though this is a, kind of a broad way of explaining how this works, it's um, kind of like splicing atoms with a butter knife. It, it gives the kids an idea of how this works. And they're incorporating 
several patterns for c computational thinking of like collision. Um, they're doing some um, absorbing and generating as well as some pooling, which is the way we end the simulation. So it's kind of a, a fun uh, way of gathering the data. This, and, and we did decided to do this in agent cubes. A lot of the people in the program are using agent sheets as the start of the two-dimensional. This is the three-dimensional program, agent cubes. And the one person moving around in the middle here is a healthcare provider. Uh, in that case, it's a nurse. And when everybody's well, it ends. So you can see it's gathering the data. This type of data can actually also be exported into a graph and then exported to Excel where the students can run iterations of this, which is a really cool way of uh, incorporating math into this as well. So I'm actually going to stop this and switch back for you. Whoa. <laughs> Didn't mean to do that. Sorry about that. <laughs> You're welcome for the special effects. Anyway, um, I, it's very involved. We, we, use, uh, we have a big emphasis of learning outcomes and success criteria in our district. And this is an easy one to really apply to that because it's really making kids think uh, quite a bit for this program. So hopefully that answers your question there, Joe. Yeah, and I know, uh, so for you, for you Lois, you were one of the teachers who became interested last year when Mark started to share out in, in kind of a professional development setting about his excitement about the project. And so you had an opportunity to just first expose students last year, I think during the late stages of the year, and then you've returned to it this year, kind of jumped in with both feet. Can you kind of talk about um, what was initially exciting about the project and what's going on in your classroom now? Um, sure. As Mark said, it's a very engaging activity. Um, we've historically taught technology from a uh, Microsoft Office capability and, and um, various different traditional instruction. And I think using the scale of the game design approach allows students to, uh, one, be engaged, to relate more to what they are producing in terms of the, uh, the physical game or the outcome of the project. And so last year when uh, Mark introduced it, I, I tried it and I learned a lot about my teaching skill. It was um, actually more important this summer when we had our institute and I, I believe Fred was the person who talked about the story behind the game. And hearing that and taking that approach really um, changed the experience I had the first time to seeing the students not only engaged in the gaming piece of it, but the actual story as they made up their Frogger-like story. It was so um, so fascinating to see students take the whole idea of a goal orientation, saying there's the character who was uh, heading towards a goal and there are these obstacles. And each student created such fascinating stories about a goal with obstacles to reaching those goals. And then um, not only creating the game, but creating the story and um, the uh, dialogue, I won't say dialogue, but, but the story behind the game, which made it even more fascinating. And, and the students were definitely more invested in the game they created because it was their their. Uh, original thought, in a sense. Yeah. If I could jump in here, Joe. Um, I, Lois, just to kind of add on to what you're saying there, that's excellent. Um, it comes into that ownership piece, and that's what's really cool about this program is that kids can design and make the game their own, and that writing it up and planning it and personalizing it, you know, taking Frogger, and maybe it's not Frogger, maybe it's with a dog and it's Dogger, or at, last year at Easter, I had kids doing bunnies and Easter eggs and some different things. So there's that ownership piece, which is really cool. So good, good point there. Exactly. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that's been notable for me is to hear Lois talk about how when she first was first was unsure and just learning how to how to teach with these tools, she was pretty regimented in terms of laying out Frogger for the kids. And I think one of the things that's been powerful for me to hear you say, Lois, is that 
when you kind of opened it up and allowed them more time to create a narrative behind it and also spend more time on the artwork, I mean, I'm just, I'm still just like in love with this one game a boy created called Afro Man. And he, Afro Man has to cross uh, many busy, a busy street and a river to get to his girlfriend. And I think that uh, the story that that middle school boy wrote, I was, first of all, I loved it, but I also thought that he was making meaning out of the project himself. And so it wasn't just a, a procedural programming exercise. It was a it was a creative project that had meaning for him, and he was still learning the computational thinking skills. So I've been inspired to see how you guys have gotten the writing in also. I think I the one thing I'd also add on is um, Mark talks about the computational thinking. And so this is something I find I'm still working through, but the ability for students to uh, read the um, behavioral screens. And so we've done a lot of practicing of, I'm the frog, if I see a truck coming to my left and the truck hits me, and so we've, we've actually stepped through the whole programming thinking as well, which is, I think, another aspect of it as they um, develop their computational thinking methods and really understand the logic of computers as well as being able to interpret uh, code sense. And that's jumping in here, that's doing the nouns and the and the verbs is what she's kicking at here that we describe. So like cars and logs and those types of things and then the, the actions that they take um, at you know descriptive things. And I think Alex also mentioned during the institute that um, the ability to place a student to place themselves in the first person of whatever that um, object or item is in the computational thinking pattern. And so whether they're the frog or the truck or um, the turtle carrying the frog across, they're, all, they're always uh, placing themselves in that position and seeing exactly uh, what's happening to that character. And I think that's, that was also valuable. And I really want to build on that even more. I didn't do it as much as I would have liked to, but I learned that students need to go through that step. That, that is really great to hear, you know, that this is working so well for you, because you know, it's uh, an idea that comes from the psychology of programming. There is, actually is such a field. I remember you mentioned it, and, and I, I realized how important it was when students weren't what happened when students didn't place themselves in the position of the, the character? It, they lost sight of exactly what had to happen in the logic and in the game. Right. Yeah. So, so Kevin, I'm wondering from your perspective as, as the director of educational technology, you know, I know this week there's, there's kind of a little bit of a debate about, you know, whether or not kids should be, you know, should learn to code. Is that the, is coding for all kids? And I, I just wonder, from your perspective, what have you been your thoughts watching kids, you know, again, not just coding, but coding video games, and uh, not getting a brief introduction, but developing skills that allow them to create both games and simulations. Can you just kind of shed some light on um, your thoughts? Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, I mean, really, in Aurora, Colorado, we're blessed to have such a diverse community. I mean, we've got students from over a hundred different countries speaking literally over a hundred different languages and so it's very interesting to kind of see um, how scalable game design might provide an opportunity to students who you know might be out of that I don't want to say normal but but just the the, the typical demographic of a computer programmer which might be a white male and so I'm just really interested in, the, in how scalable game design has been able to be leveraged um, to, to reach out to students outside of that, that typical demographic um, and, and, and provide an opportunity for such students to opt into this computer science education, um, specifically girls and students of color. So I'm really wondering, Mark and Lois, um, you know, what have you observed in the works of, of students who aren't your typical kind of computer club member 
and and how have you seen them engage in um, you know learning computational thinking skills? Um, for me personally, um, I'm I see a range of students. Most of them. the population at North is predominantly um, Hispanic, um, Black, and um, a lot of second language learners. Because of the graphical interface of, um, at least when I, we did agent sheets, I found that the transition to actually coding and creating um, the program was probably a little easier for the second language learner than if, it, if they had to do some syntactical coding. So um, the interface helped a lot. I think the biggest thing that I see, though, is when students take it on, as Mark mentions, um, it's not only that they take it on in terms of their own personal um, development of a, a game or a program or a simulation, they also take on an accountability and a collaboration with other students. So as a result, what I see is the willingness to help each other learn something and grow and as a teacher, it's, it's a pleasant thing to step out to just be the expert and, and develop experts for, um, within your um, students. And therefore, peers are finding each other and saying, look what I figured out, and look what I found. And so it, it, uh, it really develops in all populations that ability to not only learn and take on, but to learn how to instruct and share knowledge. And I think that's another value that crosses um, ethnic and, and racial lines in that sense. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. As you, sorry, Mark. As you all know, we have a we have a, a little bit of a following here on the Educator Innovator blog, and so one of the questions that kind of perked their interest was about the writing that you sometimes require students to do in this design process. And I know I've seen you you both, you know, ask students to do both narrative writing and uh, narrative writing and informational writing. So could you talk a little bit about the writing students do both to plan and then maybe even to uh, to, to function as like, you know, text that works in their game? Mark, I'll let you start and I'll follow up. There you go. Sorry about that. Yeah, uh, thank you. What I have, uh, Lois uh, and I kind of collaborated on this and I got some great ideas from Lois. Lois is very innovative in her thinking on literacy and math. Um, was that we would have students, uh, uh, well, we started talking last year about when planning these projects to have students write a narrative of going through and um, planning a project. This is one of the recent ones that I've worked with a student. This is an idea that Lois came up with, writing in the main character, the settings, the problems, and solutions inside this. And I had students sit down and do some research like on Wikipedia and some others about uh, basic cold viruses or things they wanted to get into like the bubonic plague and I had stuff, kids looking at the West Nile virus and smallpox and some of these things. They wanted to know how it worked and they took some notes and um, so forth. And then they wrote out a paragraph uh, with the topic sentence here. Uh, emulating uh, what's going to happen in their in their project. So here's a basic one from one of my seventh grade students that was doing this project. So we're writing out a narrative including the main character setting, et cetera, et cetera, here. So there's an example of one there. Um, so I do this on all my projects now. I always write up, have them write up um, these things in here. And I guess I, well, let me hold off on showing those last names there. But um, let me kick this off. Oh, you got a friend there, Joe. <laughs> Uh, she photobombs all of my uh, hangouts if possible. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I think it's very important to incorporate planning with this because you know, as students, if they choose to go this this track um, into high school uh, as uh, a computer science uh, pathway, let's say, um, and into college, and that's what we're going to be taught in college. They have to do planning, designing before they start actually doing the programming. And, and like Lois said, um, one of the great things about using agent sheets and agent cubes, it, it takes out that syntax issue. Um, I have a computer science minor from college myself. I did a lot of programming in college. 
And I have looked, I looked for, you know, 17, 18 years to find something to teach these types of thinking skills for kids that the planning piece and the, the problem solving pieces. And this has been one of those solutions. So, you know, and I wonder if that's a good point, place to, uh, to ask Alex to jump in because one of the things I know it's been a, it's been a learning journey for all of us. And, and just in the short time, we've had an opportunity to hear, you know, some of the critical questions being asked in the computer science field about instruction. And I, some of the things I've heard bandied about during this computer science education week is that we need to be careful about identifying which kids aren't interested in programming before we really have to look more closely at the teaching of programming, coding, and computer science in general before we accept that a kid isn't interested because we just have linear teaching, um, then we haven't really given, given the kids the best side of it. So I know, Alex, you've talked a lot about um, hitting the sweet spot with instruction where girls and other, you know, students that you might perceive aren't interested then show high degrees of interest. Can you talk a little bit about that? Definitely. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a specific focus to us. We are funded by the National Science Foundation in one of the projects that we are in, in the middle of is a so-called C21 uh, in computing education for the 21st century project. So that's a pretty large project, $1.5 million, that specifically explores that question to say, what is there actually a theory of broadening participation? In other words, do we actually understand what it takes to get, for instance, the girls more interested in topics such as computer science, but even science in general. And, and one of the things we found, because we have all these schools in all these different settings, from inner city schools to remote rural environments and Native American communities, we have really a gigantic collection of, of different settings in terms of teachers and students. And so we looked at all these different factors where we wanted to find out in what settings is it, does it make a difference where, where the girls are more or less motivated about computer science. And we looked at all kinds of correlations and we found that that's good news, that the biggest uh, correlation to getting the girls excited was pedagogy. And, and that's exciting because you know, it, it means this is some, something that we can work on. So specifically what we found is if a teacher used the pedagogy that we, we call it direct instruction. In other words, the teacher basically tells the students step by step what to do, but without necessarily providing any explanation. In other words, something like, now do this, press this button, enter this, drag this thing over here, and then at the end you have a game. Turns out that for the boys, that's still acceptable. They still like that somewhat. But, but for, for the girls, they, their level of motivation is dropping off big time. They're just not as interested, and we can only speculate why precisely, what precisely the reasons for that would be. But but it seems that, that if they don't get a sense of you know what else could we have been doing, what what is the purpose of this specific step, they, they seem to lose interest. And, and so we have also looked at different pedagogies such as inquiry-based approaches. So if the teacher instead really says, now we have a challenge here in our Frogger game, for instance, where we want to have a, well, the truck is about to hit the frog. How should we how should we think about this? Should we think about this from the viewpoint of the frog or from the viewpoint of the truck? And how would we think about this? The moment where these kinds of strategies are being used, turns out the level of interests are essentially the same in boys and, and girls. And that's exciting because it's not a trade-off. So we're not saying, well, if we teach like this, then the boys will enjoy it more or less, or if it teach like that, then we lose the other half. So, so basically, there is a sweet spot where we can use teaching approaches such as um, inquiry-based approaches that actually benefit both boys and girls. And so to that end, what we actually include in the professional development of teachers, we, we do and we don't tell them initially, so it's a bit sneaky. We do a little bit of a role play so we bring in three different teachers using three different teaching styles. And then it's quite interesting for us to see the reactions of the teachers, because initially they don't realize it is role play. So then they would say things like, this is 
this is really not very nice, you know, because this person doesn't explain us anything why he or she is doing this. So this is hard to follow and frustrating. And then in, in the reflection part of the activity, that they, they, they get a sense of what, what the different styles are. And, and often we find it can make a big difference. And so many of the teachers then come back later, maybe a late, year later, and we videotape some of the teachers. And, and they say, you know, I've been teaching for 31 years or something like that. And I've, I thought I've seen all the things that can happen in the classroom. But now that I've tried to use some of these ideas, everything is completely different. And to us, that's, of course, super exciting because, you know, pedagogy is really something that we can shift and, and, and something that we can change. And in, in result, we, we can really find a way to have a very predictable strategy to, to broaden participation and get the girls and minority students excited about computer science and science in general. So I wonder about, uh, you know, you know, Kevin, in terms of uh, when you take a look at a project like this and sort of the claims, the claims that this research, you know, makes and is also trying to trying to prove maybe that you know that ped pedagogy becomes the equalizer with computer science education and interest in programming. What are some of the implications in your work and for for our school district? Look, I, I, I think it's simple that, that we all know as educators that we must provide opportunity for all of our students to find success in whatever niche that they, they have interest in. Um, you know, when you, when you see statistics, you know, in the United States that there's a severe deficit in the workforce um, within the niche of the different computer sciences and that we, we typically, you know, import talent from outside of our country. Um, it, it, it's obvious that, look, we have to set up a pipeline and provide opportunity for all of our students to be able to access um, the, the skills necessary to find success in computer science. And to, and to really, um, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in seeing how we can provide access for our elementary school students, um, developing them into when they get to middle school level, um, carrying on with, with computer science into the high school level and creating that real pipeline to university and then post-secondary um, workforce. Um, you know, I, I just, I, I feel that that scalable game design in conjunction with this concept in Aurora Public Schools called Pathways and really provides an opportunity for students to um, kind of employ some of the ideals of connected learning in the sense that students are able to pursue what their interests are and, and get into specific areas like computer science within a STEM pathway and be able to develop their skills um, and that access is provided to all of our students. So, um, you know, this concept of pathways is, is something unique um, to Aurora Public Schools in the sense that we, you know, we're developing relationships with, with community members, both institutionally, commercially, um, with university. And so I have a really deep interest in our partnership with the University of Colorado Boulder, um, you know, in Dr. Repanin in the computer science department. And how do we set up a pipeline so that we can, we can have students, you know, garner interest at, at a young age around computer science and start to learn computational thinking skills at an early age get them in making some games, but moving on to creating simulations and models which we know are being asked, our students are being asked, um, you know, when you look at Common Core, the new science um, uh, um, standards that, hey, look, our, our students have to be able to, um, you know, justify their thinking, provide evidence, and even create simulations and models to, to, to brandish data to, to reinforce, you know, the arguments that they're making. And so I just find it fascinating when a tool such as Scalable Game Design, which provides clear access to all of our students, which is so important, not just small niches of students, um, to get them interested in, in something where we, as a nation, we, we, have to, we have to 
fill jobs within con computer science um, area. So, you know, we're just looking for ways where we've got pockets of excellence, like in Lois's classroom and Mark's classroom, and in a few other classrooms at the middle school level. We've been able to expand into the high school level. Um, and we're really looking to provide this opportunity in an equitable way to all of our students. And so we, the only way that you can do that is not having just these limited pockets of excellence um, or interest at, at specific schools um, in just certain computer labs, but we need to be able to scale this up at a district level, and that's what we're really interested in, and that's the work that we're currently engaged in. One of the things I think is exciting about it is, uh, first of all, I think just the little time I've been observing um, drag-and-drop programming, it's, it's how quickly students are able to provide peer support on something as complex as program programming a game. So I think I'd be interested to hear the teachers talk about, you know, how quickly students do provide peer support, because that's part of connected learning is that, you know, learning is peer supported. Um, the other thing is that as we think about scaling up, I, I'd be interested to hear Mark talk about um, hearing the different teachers express interest in our district, and then Mark has really kind of been emblematic of something that the National Writing Project is always interested in, which is teachers teaching teachers, that the best professional development is a knowledgeable teacher who's had success in the classroom sharing it out. And so I, I wonder about those two things. How do we get students supporting students with this design-centered, production-centered type of uh, curriculum? And then, Mark, what's it like supporting your peers when they're genuinely interested in transforming their pedagogy? Well, look, first let's talk about students. I, I find it an incredible um, scaffolding piece in my room to, for students to coach each other because um, I'm not going to claim that I know it all because I don't. <laughs> no teacher does. And different students learn in different ways. So this is a, a tool that we use for supporting each other, um, whereas when I'm demonstrating the room, another student might be able to explain it a little better than I can. And in these days where our class sizes are so large, um, it's a great tool for other students to help each other. As well, we're talking about revising and editing. Revising and editing, not just your writing, but um, your programming. So um, as other students are reading your programming and um, in Agent Sheets and Agent Cubes, we call it conversational programming. Um, you can have the program talk to you and do some different things like that, show the examples of that. But the students can read each other's programming and go, hey, you, you had an arrow off here, or you mistyped the name of the method there, or these little pieces, and they get that feedback. And then the final piece that, that peer coaching gives is evaluation. Um, I use success criteria sheets listing out all the different steps the students need to finish, including the computational thinking patterns they're completing. And I have each student have at least two other students from the room evaluate their program and give them feedback. And they give them feedback on um, things that they need to fix, things that they could do to improve their program. What could you do to make this uh, game or simulation better? And then uh, something to complement them possibly as well. Uh, and moving on to your second part of your question, um, I find it very exciting to help other teachers learn. Uh, that's something that really motivates me as a teacher is when I get to sh share my experience with them and help them learn and grow from that. So I don't even remember how long ago it was. Maybe Alex, you can remember. Uh, about I think it was about four years ago I was first asked to share um, up at one of the summer institutes how to do a, a part of programming Frogger with them and that's something I do already as a technology coordinator in my building. I've been doing it for many years teaching other teachers um, but this is even more exciting because I find the engagement level so incredible with kids so to get other teachers using it and finding out how powerful this really is uh, is a lot of fun so um, sitting down and, and teaching other teachers um, I, I've done several times on my own traveled and found or had some t people ask me from um, technology in, in Colorado uh, conference up in uh, Copper Mountain every summer I've given a, a presentation there and I had some teachers call me and say hey how could I get further involved in this program 
And I, uh, one year, drove up to Granby and trained a couple teachers up there. And I've, last year, I trained several of the teachers here in Aurora um, to get get involved with this. So to me, teaching other teachers is is a lot of fun, and I enjoy it a lot. So I don't know if that does that help with there, Joe. And the only thing I would say I'd add to what Mark was talking about from the student standpoint is um, some of the analytical um, aspects of scalable game design. I'm seeing uh, the ability for students to do the debug side of it. We've been talking about the programming side of it. But then to start uh, developing that uh, an anal anal analytical thinking piece of saying, why isn't this working? Why um, why did uh, the frog disappear in the middle of the game? What in the uh, um, behavioral uh, programming uh, caused this to happen? Why did the frog die after? Well, I guess when the truck goes on the other side. You know, all of the typical things that students sometimes do with um, mis um, understanding the direction where the truck is coming from, when when the frog should die, those types of things. And I'm seeing that it really um, develops some of their ability to focus on detail and look at someone else's work and really um, analyze what's working, what's not working. And that's something that I want to see happen more and more with my students, not just the collaboration and the creating of the game, but then uh, develop uh, collaboration in the analysis of what works and what doesn't work. And one of the things I uh, have done is uh, when a student's program isn't working, one of the teachers in the Summer Institute talked about uh, doing a showcase at the beginning of every class. So someone could go up front and say, well, this isn't working in my game. Could, could the class help? And I think that's a valuable thing to do. And I think it um, truly develops an analytical skill um, whereas we've been talking about the logical thinking piece as well. I, I would add into that as well. Trying to get students to answer an essential set of questions possibly, or even just uh, a thinking question, um, instead of the student raising their hand saying, hey, my game's not working. Um, I, I don't let them do that. They have to tell me what specifically is wrong, what did they do to try to solve the problem, what scaffolding pieces did they use, um, and what specific agents do you think that affects. And in that, talking back to the, the peer coaching piece, I'm having students ask that of each other now, which is kind of cool. I've kind of, they've gotten to the point saying, uh, it's not just wrong. You have to tell me specifically what's going wrong here. And, you know, and, and then that's, there's that thinking piece there, being analytical, as Lois said. I'd, I'd like to just jump in quickly about um, the, the teachers being able to work with the teachers. So, so for instance, Mark being able to share his expertise with you know, Lois and, and other teachers around scalable game design. Um, you know, from a from where I sit as a director, I'm concerned with you know kind of the systems that are in place to foster such collaboration and sharing, and really you know what what's in place for um, someone like Lois and, and some of the other teachers who uh, might be fairly new to this relative to Mark. How could their learning be accelerated? And so you know, from a systems point of view, as I was mentioning earlier, I'm interested in how we take these pockets of excellence and we spread this across the entire district, scale up district-wide so that every student has opportunity to access um, you know, this kind of curriculum and develop these computational thinking skills. So we're lucky in our district that administration and teachers um, were able to agree on having um, professional development time set aside um, each week that is about an hour and a half, hour, 45 minutes, couple hours there. Um, where teachers come together to look at student work, to come together to talk about their practice, to share out um, their new learnings, and, and really we try to, optimally we try to have it be facilitated by, by teachers um, and or instructional coaches, um, but really teachers sharing with teachers. And so I think what uh, is critical as far as helping us um, scale up at a district level 
is to have these times that are intentionally set aside for professional development for our teachers to come together because we're seeing that as we want to expand into more into the high school level remember creating that pipeline to university and beyond um, we're able to leverage that time where the teachers are already together to provide them some focus to to show them you know something like scalable game design to pique their interest and to get them excited about something so that we can then build their capacity around it and then offer this in their classrooms at the high school level. So from a systems point of view, I believe that um, in order to find success scaling up, there's got to be time set aside to do so for teachers to collaborate. Yeah. So Kevin, I think you named some of the, you know, some of the interesting uh, logistics and challenges about scaling up something like this in a district, you know, as large as ours, which is about 53, 53 schools. And, uh, but I also know that the scalable game design project has a, has a much larger life outside of APS. And it's, I think, it, I think it's the biggest, the largest study ever of middle school computer science. And so I think, uh, it might be a good time as we're running out of time here, or we're getting short on time to have Alex talk a little bit about how I know there's a special opportunity during this week for teachers to, uh, to play around with and gain a little bit of experience with some of the programming tools. So maybe you could talk about that and also talk about how someone might find out more about participating in scalable game design. Right, so the specific events we're talking about here is the Hour of Code. And the Hour of Code is trying and in fact already succeeded to attract uh, 10 million students to at least give uh, the idea of programming a chance by spending roughly an hour during this particular week. And there's a, a collection of 30 different tutorials. One of them we have uh, created. And the idea is basically, you know, just pick a tutorial and, and spend an hour, you know, solve a puzzle, make a game, in our particular case, and I shared the link uh, in, in the chat, make a, a 3D game. So we have created an activity called uh, Make a 3D Frogger. So basically what, what it is, it's an Agent Cubes online activity where people can just go to and then everything and, and sort of it's a, it's a first of its kind interface, everything is happening in the browser. So what people are doing, what, what students are doing is they completely build all the characters of the game and they can turn them into 3D objects and then they program them. And, and so, so that's, uh, it doesn't require an, an application. All of these can be done at any point in time. If, if people finish the game, they can submit it, but e even if it's not completely finished, they, they can submit it and they receive an email with a certificate and they can, at home or at school, continue working on the game. And so, so the effort overall has been very successful. You know, the, the goal, which seemed pretty outrageous at the time, you know, the 10 million students has already been reached. And so, so we get an, an enormous amount of exposure, you know, where kids, and it's in fact not, not just in the U.S., it's, it's a worldwide event get exposed to this idea of at least giving computer science or programming a chance. Here's the example of that site. I, I, have, I pulled that up for you guys. Let me uh, start that for you and show it to you. This is the one hour of code uh, link for students to create with the instructions and, and so forth and so on. If you hadn't had a chance to uh, get out to the wiki those of you who are visiting us for the first time um, are seeing this. This is the uh, Agent Cubes online version of it with the tutorial. So this is kind of a, a cool tool, and I would encourage you to go out and try it out. Yeah, so, so it includes you know, a complete uh, a video that shows you all the steps of how to make uh, the characters, but also it has a skip ahead, so you can say, oh, I'm not interested in that part. I'm going to jump to some other part, 
And of course, the idea is that you, you don't really have to follow the tutorial. Right? It's just an idea. If you really want to make a game like this, follow the tutorial. But, but essentially, in the first segment, you already get exposed to the main ideas that allow you to create your own very simple game. And then if you have more time, you, you can continue with the tutorial and make it more complete and more sophisticated one. Excellent. Well, hey, so now we are just about out of time. So I'd like to just kind of quickly whip around with a, a sort of a last thought for Computer Science Education Week and the Hour of Code. What's something maybe you'll take away from this conversation? I, I know for me, uh, this week was a wonderful opportunity to introduce my students to not just, um, well, they've already used scalable game design, but not just the um, 3D um, Asian cubes that they had online, but we talked a lot about the, um, the different professions in computer science and uh, some of the statistics that I had found on the Hour of Code, especially, I think right now, each graduate, it's a 3 to 1 ratio of three jobs to one graduate. And so I told them, there's a need. Uh, there's a need for um, young people to um, come into this field and they, at this stage, can start thinking about their opportunities and options and, and developing their skills. And so I, that was my main thing. I, I just felt it was such a wonderful opportunity to talk to students about yet another choice that they have in their educational lifetime and uh, their career choices. So that, was, that was my piece. And, and I thought it was a wonderful um, site that was put together to introduce students to um, the coding process, not just in the school, but that they, they can go home and, and also try it and share with their family. For me, uh, I, I found uh, that I have more than just a com one week of computer science education. I'm constantly doing it. And with scalable game design, it's just a, a fun activity all the time. I just at least once a week, maybe a couple times a week, I have a student come to me and say, man, I really enjoy this. This is really fun. I get a kick out of doing this, Mr. Scholl. This is my favorite class. You know, and that, that really excites me as a teacher to hear that when kids say that to me. Um, you know, I don't, I'm not the type of teacher I go out of my way to advertise myself and sell my, what I'm doing. I like to just uh, let the students do the speaking for me, I guess. And that, it's exciting for me to see that in this, um, this Computer Science Education Week is just a, an awesome way of expanding. And Alex, I just want to give you guys a great compliment for that great tool that you and the team up at CU built. Really cool. Thanks a lot. And thanks to Joe and, and Kevin for all your support over the last year, guys. Yeah, I'd like to piggyback off of what Mark said. I, I, I just think it's fantastic that um, Aurora Public Schools is in partnership with University of Colorado Boulder and that we're able to access, um, you know, a, a, a program um, that, that scalable game design. I mean, it, it's, it's agent sheets in two dimensions and and agent cubes in three dimensions and that it provides an entry point for our students to kind of um, begin to understand computational thinking skills um, to get psyched about programming because let's be honest um, in the conventional sense when I when I took my programming class at CU Boulder actually um, Alex wasn't teaching it so no worries um, I just uh, you know, sometimes it, it, it feels abstract and so hyper complicated and and hard to um, Kind of make tangible and real, and I think that you know, scalable game design does a good job of providing that entry point to to you know get kids excited because they like the game. Many of them do, and so they start to make games you know modeled on classic games that some of us of our generations maybe grew up playing, and uh, and then to take it beyond that into models and simulations um, that we know are so important these days that are leveraged for for economics, etc., um, we have to fill those jobs in our country with our own students and let them be proud of what they're doing and get excited about what they're doing and allow the opportunity for all of our students. And so that's my takeaway, and I, I appreciate Scalable Game Design and our partnership with CU as well. 
No, I want to thank you. You know, I mean, this is really an exciting partnership for us because you know it's one thing to to work, you know, with, with a couple of schools that that are just individual efforts. I think it's really absolutely essential that that the leadership of, of a district really recognizes the need for something like computer science at, at that level. Because otherwise, I think it would be very difficult, you know, for teachers to really ultimately make a difference. So, so the fact that, that you guys have really started to systemically integrate these ideas in, into the curriculum and, and, and found a way, you know, to create an ecosystem with the teachers supporting other teachers, that's very exciting to us. And, and, uh, and it's also great for us to, to see, even in the things that I just heard, you know, from, from the teachers Right here, you know, we, we create all these theories, and you know, we're academics, and, and and things sometimes are not necessarily very applied. But but I can sort of hear you say things that at least feel me that make me feel that there's hope, right? So we actually have some theories, and we try to make that part of teacher professional development, and and I, I can see things coming back. So these were not just completely crazy ideas, right? So it actually seems to work. So so that's great to hear. All right. Well, on that note, I want to thank everyone for joining us. And I definitely want to thank the National Writing Project for allowing us to have this special little APS version of Educator Innovator webinar. And uh, I'm just excited for the, uh, the innovative practices our students are getting to experience and also the idea that tools like the ones we use in scalable game design are allowing teachers who aren't master programmers themselves to think about how programming can give students access to new ways to look at problem solving, and new ways to look at critical thinking. So I'm excited for uh, the tools emerging for teachers to become, you know, more and more innovative every day. So uh, as a final word here, if you haven't already and you're viewing this in YouTube or in the archive, please sign up at the Educator Innovator blog to receive notifications about upcoming opportunities like webinars, tweet ups, online resources, and more from the range of Educator Innovator partners. So thanks everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.